Good morning, Grand Point. It's uh, good to see all of you here today. It's good to see some of our college students back in the house again and home for vacation. Uh, it's my privilege to be able to uh, be part of the team that is bringing you the story uh, through this month of December, through the Advent season. The story of Christmas, the story that did not begin with a baby in the manger, but a story that began with grief in the heart of our God. And it was a grief that was also connected to our grief because of sin. And see, when sin came into this world, and I, I, we're going to talk a little bit about this this morning, but when sin came into this world, our hearts experienced the brokenness that was caused by that, and that brokenness was displayed in our constant drive and desire and pursuit for love and joy and peace and hope and all of those things that we sometimes look for in all the wrong places. I want to add another chapter to the story today, a chapter called The Plan. I, I believe it was, I, I, I don't remember specifically, I believe it was our 25th anniversary. Uh, I had a plan. It was not a big like plan for some kind of an exotic vacation or going anywhere. It was a plan to take my bride of 25 years out to dinner. Just a nice dinner. We lived in southern Lancaster at that time, and it was near the Willow Valley Resort. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but Willow Valley had this diner. And so when Penny knew we were going out for dinner, she's like, any place except Willow Valley Diner. She's not a diner person, so, I mean, we diner food's okay. Some of you are diner people. It's, it's awesome. Willow Valley's not bad, but it just it was, it was our last, the last place we wanted to go. So I decided to take her to this really upscale restaurant, downtown Lancaster, and uh, we arrived there. We went down these steps into this. I mean, it was, it was like a romantic place. It was just coming at us. We stepped into this little room, and there was this host there in the corner behind this little desk, and he had this nice little, little black jacket on. His job was to size up the patrons coming in to see if we would be able to fit in this place. I had never been to this place before. I heard about it. I've never been there, so I didn't know the menu. I didn't know the prices. But, but they had a, an open menu there in the lobby for people like us, like me. So we looked at the, uh, the menu, and uh, the, the first thing there on the list of appetizers was torchon de flou gras. If you know French, you can correct me on that, but, um, and tell me what I would have eaten if I would have gotten that as well. So <laughs> it, was, it was extremely expensive, so we didn't, we didn't get that. I went to the second uh, list, uh, second item on the appetizer list, and it was the cider braised rabbit leg with smoked sweet potato pierogies with rosemary sage brown butter for $27. So I thought, okay, that, that might, might be good. I don't know what all that. I've never eaten rabbit leg before, but this could be good. An entree of interest was uh, bacon wrapped lamb loin for $55. And of course, you can't do a romantic dinner on your 25th anniversary without dessert. Right, so I noticed on the dessert menu there was a vanilla bean creme brulee. It was the cheapest thing on there for eleven bucks. Now I'm doing the math. I'm already up to ninety three dollars a person on this. Right, <laughs> this does not include any drinks, and they had a whole list of drinks under this title libations. Right, and that didn't include coffee or anything like that. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm thinking I'm doing this math in my head. I'm, this is going to with tip and everything. It's going to be about a two hundred sixty dollar dinner. Now, just know. My wife is worth every cent of this. That is not the problem. <laughs> that is not the problem. The problem is I was too cheap. I was way too cheap. I'm looking at this thinking, man, I love my wife, but I'm not sure that I can spend $260 on dinner with her. So we left. The little guy in the corner was kind of smiling as we walked out the door. We went across the street to the Lancaster Dispensing Company. Now, totally different atmosphere, right? We walk into this dispensing company, and it is loud, and it is celebrative, and it is energizing, the perfect environment for certain occasions, but not for a nice romantic 25th wedding anniversary dinner. So we left there. The plan is not working real well so far. We left there, and I remembered this other restaurant just outside of Lancaster City. It was a renovated barn. And uh, they turned this barn into a restaurant. They had a chocolate uh, confectionery uh, place next. I think it was called Evans. And I remember being there once before, and I remember seeing those romantic booths all around, candlelit romantic booths sitting all around the main dining area. I'm like, that's it. My plan was for Lancaster, but we're going to go outside Lancaster and uh, have this romantic dinner. The food was good there. I've been there before. So we get to Evans, and it was closed. 
It was closed. Out of business. So we left there, and we went to Willow Valley Diner for our 25th <laughs> wedding anniversary. I kid you not. I kid you not. You call it poor planning or whatever it is. I just, I just did not plan well. I didn't uh, read the menus. I didn't call ahead. I didn't make reservations. I didn't count the cost of this. I hate to, I, I would love to say that I more than made it up <laughs> in, in the years after that, but I'm not sure that I have. So I still owe my wife a very nice anniversary dinner. At least that's the plan. All right. Now, what I want you to know, though, about this magnificent story that we've been talking about through this Advent season is that we've been we're considering it in this story. There is the plan. Listen, the plan of God Himself to bring Jesus into this world to do whatever it takes in order for you and I to have an abundant, fulfilling, limitless life that He had planned for us. And thank God He thought it through. Thank God he was not too cheap to do what his plan required him to do. He was willing to pay the price. Now, I want to show you this morning what this plan included. We know from the story of Luke that the baby born to Mary would be called the son of God. And like any good father, God loved his son. He loved his son. Uh, in Matthew chapter 17, there's this narrative that we call the transfiguration. And it's Peter, James, and John. They're up there in this mountain with Jesus. And when they're all alone there with him, something utterly astonishing happens. And all of a sudden, God gives uh, Jesus this appearance of glory. Matthew 17 verse 2 says, his face shone like the sun. His garments just became white as light. And then in verse 5, it says this bright cloud overshadows them and God speaks out of the cloud and he says this in Matthew 17 verse 5 this is my son pointed to Jesus this is my son whom I love and with him I am well pleased listen to him Listen, this happened on one other occasion as well at Jesus' baptism as the Holy Spirit's coming down, to, down and anointing Jesus for ministry, signifying the Father's love and support. God says, this is my son. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. See, when God looks at his son, man, he enjoys, he admires, he cherishes, he prizes, he relishes what he sees. This is the love of a good father. And then over in the Gospel of John, Jesus himself actually speaks several times about his Father's love for him. For example, John 3, verse 35, Jesus says, The Father, man, loves the Son, has placed all things, everything into his hands. John chapter 5, verse 20, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that, that he does. Man, there is no question at all that God loved his Son. But Isaiah says, Yet... It was the Lord's will to crush him, to crush him and cause him to suffer. Let me stop right there and tell you about Isaiah. Isaiah was one of God's prophets. God used him to prophesy about things that were coming, including the Messiah. And uh, Isaiah, of course, wrote this book of Isaiah, whose chapters 53 and, or 52 and 53 are sometimes referred to as the, the fifth gospel. In this gospel, Isaiah speaks about this remnant that's vicariously suffering on behalf of other people. And it is for this reason that some people believe that Isaiah 53 is the prophecy about a nation. Or, or not only 53, but the whole uh, book of Isaiah, and it is spoken a lot. There's a lot of speaking words to Israel and to the nation, the nation of Israel. And yet in chapter 53, this remnant is narrowed down to one, to one. He's an individual who's exalted through humiliation. Listen to what Isaiah says. He was despised and he was rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief as, as, and as one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows and yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. Listen to this. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. 
He was like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And then they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, though he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. See, this seems to be a very clear reference to the son whom the father loved. And it was the father's will, the father's plan, the father's pleasure to crush him. And this is one of those verses that is expansive, which simply means that we could spend all day here talking about this, which we're not going to do. But I do want to take these next 20 minutes to make sure that we get our minds wrapped around this and that we get our hearts open to this radical thing that this verse is communicating. See, some of your translations actually say, it pleased the Lord to crush him and put him to grief. Listen, the question I'm asking myself, asking all of us today is, how could it be that the Father, God the Father, would ever find pleasure in the crushing of his son? Man, if you're a parent in the room, think about that. Think about that. Think of the heart that you have for your children. Listen, when you love your kids, you fear for them. You hurt for them. You do everything you you can to protect your children from danger. In fact, sometimes you give them these warnings, protective warnings over and over and over again. And after a while, they just roll their eyes at you because you've said this so many times. But you do that because you love them. And you want to protect them from any danger that their lives, that, that they might face. In fact, you even pray that their lives would be free from difficulty. We pray that our kids' lives would be a success. Listen, you want anything, you, you would never want anything like what is being described in this verse between a father and a son to happen to one of your children. So Penny and I had three kids, and I remember clearly when our kids were hurting, like when they, you know, are sick, and I just wanted to take that from them. I hated to see them hurt. Now it's with our grandkids, right? Just I'll take that sickness. So, so we have a son. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a big boy, about 6'4". Um, he lived most of his adult life and young adult life with severe back pain. We, we believe it came from a sports injury. Um, we're not exactly sure. It was never pinned down exactly, but it has a lot of back pain. There was day after day when I would look at my son who was just writhing in pain and just longed to take that pain from him. Not that I love pain, but I just didn't want him to experience it. And, but here's, here's a father looking at his son now saying that he found pleasure in subjecting him to that. Listen, what could possibly be in the heart of God that would allow him to do that? And here's the answer. And I want you to hear me on this. The answer for this particular uh, question that we're asking is love. It's simply love. Magnificent, faithful, joyous, redeeming love. I want you to say this with me. I think, I think you know this. John chapter 3, verse 16, all together, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Here's what happened. God looked at this broken world. He looked at us broken inside, now separated from him in this, in this broken relationship. This one thing that we were created for is now broken And God looked at that, and his heart was so full of love, so full of grace, so full of compassion that he was not willing for the world and for us to stay in this condition. And because of the nature of sin, listen, we were not able to help ourselves. We cannot fix the world. We were unable to restore the brokenness. So God moved in on our behalf. And God loved. And even though it cost him his son, he gave. Listen, you need to know that God did not find pleasure in the particular moments of the suffering of his son. But he found pleasure in what that suffering would result in. Our healing. Our hope. He found pleasure in that. See, this is bottom line, a story of significant love, a love that we could never achieve, a love that we can never earn, a love that we don't deserve. It's a love that must be given as a gracious gift. And God loves us, God loves us so much that he would be willing to subject his son to such unthinkable things 
The suffering and the agony and the pain that his son went through is, is unbelievable. And God allowed it to happen simply because he loves you. And here's why. Here's why he was willing to do this. The death of his one son, his one son would give life to many. That's the plan. That's the plan. Now, my guess is that most of you heard John 3.16 before. You might even have it memorized. Some of you say, that's my favorite verse. Maybe you heard about this incredible love story before and how you're included in it. And no doubt, many of you in this room have responded to it and you personalized the story by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your personal Savior. See, that was God's plan for all of us to restore us. Many of us did that. Maybe there's someone in this room, though, who does not know what that's all about. And I want you to stay with us today. We're so glad that you're here and uh, watching online, watching in the video venue, wherever you are today. I'm so glad you're here. And the reason that I'm giving this emphasis, the emphasis to this story uh, today, to this plan of God, is because in sometime, sometime next week, sometime next month, Sometime in the coming year, there's, you, you will be in some circumstance, you will be in some location, you will be in some relationship where you will be tempted to doubt the love of God. It might be a moment of physical suffering, and you're wondering why God allowed this pain uh, to be a part of your experience. Maybe it will be in the midst of a very significant relational disappointment where someone you love so much has turned their back on you and walked away from you, and you wonder why God brought this into your life. Maybe it will be a moment of financial difficulty, and you have sought to obey God and all that. You've sought to be a good steward of all of his resources, and you did everything right, but your job is coming to an end. You didn't see it coming, and it just doesn't make any sense. Or maybe it's not that something is going to happen to you personally, and you're looking around in this world that we live in, and certainly in this world, it looks like evil is prevailing, and you wonder, where is God? Why, where is his power? Where is his love? Isaiah 53.10 is your argument. Isaiah 53.10 is your argument. This is the place that you run to because not only does the giving of Christ argue for the magnificence of God's love, but it also argues that he will continue to love you. God's love is not a one-time event. No, God's love is a daily, day-by-day truth and reality. There's a scripture in Romans that affirms this. Romans chapter 8, verse 32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us what? All things. All things. Paul's logic is this. If God would do this radical thing to offer his son to the cruel suffering and death on a cross, why would he not also give us everything else that we need? It would make absolutely no sense at all for God to do this radical thing and then turn his back on you in your moment of need. And so Paul argues that God will be faithful to you. Listen, he's going to be with you. He's going to be in you. He's going to be for you and will meet your needs as you walk through this life toward eternity. And the guarantee of all of that is the cross. Now, I want to take a moment here and uh, just clarify needs. We sometimes have a problem uh, with that word needs. We, we dump a lot of things into that needs category, don't we? We upload a lot of uh, things, and I just want you to know that Paul's not saying in Romans chapter 8 that God is going to sign your wish list. That's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is that God, who knows exactly what your needs are, is committed to meeting them. We think we know what they are, but God absolutely knows what they are. So if God did this for you, he will meet all your needs. Now, I want you to understand this. I want to leave you with a few things that you need to know, and that is this. God's plan is not always easy for us to understand. In fact, here's your first takeaway. There are things that God will do in your life that you will not understand. They make absolutely no sense to you at all. In Psalm chapter 13, uh, verses 1 and 2, David is writing this, and David was in a great relationship with the Lord. He was a man after God's own heart, and God loved him. And, and yet even David says this. He says, how long, Lord? 
Like, how long, Lord? I've been praying to you. I've been asking for this. I've been waiting. I've been waiting. How long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day after day after day have this sorrow in my heart? I don't know if you've ever experienced that or not, or maybe you're feeling like that right now, like you've been searching for something and you've been asking God and just waiting and waiting, and you're, you're now saying, how long, Lord, do I need to wait for this? See, God's plan, the situations, experiences, and things that God brings into our lives is sometimes confusing. But listen, you will never find rest You'll never find calm. You'll never find peace and security of heart by means of understanding because there are things in your life that you will not understand. In fact, two chapters later in Isaiah 55, the prophet records the words of the Lord who says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's higher ways, God's higher plans, God, God, God's, God, God's got it, right? He's looking at you from a totally different level. You're looking at your life by like what you're going through right now. You're looking at your life counting weeks and months and kind of years and all that. God is looking down at you and seeing the total of eternity with you included in it. So God's ways are totally uh, different than ours. In other words, God's plan will not always be understood or God's plan will not always make sense to us. But here's what I want you to get. His plan to crush his son and subject him uh, to grief is God's plan that you do need to understand because he is talking about the cross. See, the plan was that Christ had to come. He had to be willing to live in the midst of the harsh realities of this world. He had to be willing to list, to live in the midst of all the temptations in this fallen world. And he had to be obedient to his father, even to the point of being crushed and even being sacrificed on the cross to carry our sins and to satisfy the anger of God. From day one, that little baby was destined to die. I want you to know this. This cross right here is not a moment of defeat. This is not a mistake. This is not an interruption to the plan. The cross is the plan. The cross is the plan from day one. God knew what you needed. God knew what I needed. He sent that baby not to just live among us, but ultimately he sent that baby to die. That was the plan. Now, I don't know, and it's probably a good thing that I don't know, all the things that you brought into this room this morning. I don't know all the hardships that you're facing. I don't know all the grief that maybe is in your heart. I don't know what temptations you're struggling with, but I do know that there will be times when you will question God's goodness and you'll wonder where he is and you'll wonder what in the world is he doing? I do know that there's an enemy who would also just love to whisper in your ear saying, where is your God now? I thought he was supposed to be close. I thought he was always supposed to be with you. Where is your God now? Where is his power now? I thought this God that you serve is this all-powerful God. Listen, Isaiah 53.10 can arm you in those moments. God's love is so near, so powerful, so faithful, so willing that he would be pleased to give his son over to cruel suffering and cruel death so that you and I would know life. And if he would do such a thing, If he would do such a thing as the cross, it is absolutely inconceivable that he would abandon you in your moment of need. He will not. He will not. Remember the cross. Next time you think God has forgotten you, next time you think God may not love you, next time you think that maybe God skipped over you for some reason, Maybe when you're not feeling valued, when you're not feeling like there's a purpose for you, remember the cross. Remember the cross. God, the father who loved his son, was willing to send his son to be crushed, to suffer, to be persecuted, to die for you. That's magnificent love. And because he did that, listen, he will not abandon you. He would not do that, sacrifice his son, and then let you go the rest of your life. No, he's always there for you. 
There's no more clear pointed, no more rest giving demonstration of the love of God than the gift of his son. Thank God for his plan. Thank God he did not abandon his plan. Thank God he did not consider it too costly to follow through. In your moment of doubt, fear, or discouragement, don't run from this one. Run toward him. Run towards that love. I don't know where you are with Christ today. I don't know what you've done with the Savior. This child that was born for you. Maybe you have accepted his gift of salvation. Maybe you have not. And maybe you think like, it's just kind of like living a good life is all that I need to do. Let me just assure you that you cannot live a good enough life on your own. You can't. It is absolutely impossible. No amount of good that you do can actually come close to what is needed in your life for the forgiveness of our sins, forgiveness of your sins. But Christ made it possible. That is the plan. That's the purpose of Christmas. That's why we worship him today. We're gonna stand here for a moment. Go ahead and stand, would you? I wanna pray over you. And then we're gonna sing our closing song together because I really, really do want this to be your story. I don't want this just to be a story or the story, but I want you to have the assurance that it is your story. So let me pray for you, and then we'll sing together. Lord God, in this world of darkness and sin where things really are not operating the way that you intended them as a creator. We admit there are a lot of moments of confusion for us. There are moments when it doesn't feel like we're experiencing your promises. There are moments when we wonder if you're, if you're even present. Moments when it seems like we're outside the span of your care, outside the span of your grace. Lord, in these moments of confusion, we, we also admit that the enemy is often coming to kind of whisper even greater doubt into our ears. But we pray that in those moments, we would remain strong in our faith. We would remain strong in the power and faithfulness of your love, remembering that if you gave your son to be crushed, to face grief for us, for our redemption, that you will also provide for us along the way. God, may we remember your plan Run to it, run to you, and not from you. We pray this in the name of our Jesus, our Lord, and our Savior. And all God's children said, Amen.